It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 249 of Science on Top. Today is Wednesday the 30th of November 2016. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hey mate. And on the show today we find out why the world's coconuts may be in short supply. We take a look at a huge ice deposit on Mars. And we tell the happy story of Jeremy the Snail. <laughs> but first, let's talk about the meteor that wiped out the dinosaurs. Earlier this year, we talked about the team that was going to drill down into the Chicxulub crater, the impact site, for the first time ever. That was in May. They have successfully taken core samples. And Lucas, they've found that it was, um, it was a really massive impact, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, we, we certainly knew, you know, there was, there was a lot of evidence for... for we knew it was big. <laughs> yeah, we knew it was big, but how big are you? Yeah, so we, you know, it, it was it was more a case of um, lining up additional courses of evidence. And and, in, and that's certainly what happened here. The the, uh, the the team is certainly very happy with the with the outcome of the uh, of the of the core drilling and so forth and they got they got down a fair way as well, as well with the with the drilling that they were doing the intention was to get down i think it's about 1500 meters and they got pretty close to that i believe so that's quite a way down but where this was centered and i can't remember what we what we discussed last time but where this was centered was was a particular part of the impact crater itself uh, which is basically sort of a ring on the inside of the crater, uh, it's it's about a sort of a third of the way from the out, from the outer edge of the the impact crater, uh, and this this ring is basically the uh, part of the the impact crater that contains rock that basically moved the most um, when the impact occurred. And there's a really cool graphic on the BBC.com website, which I'm sure Ed will include. Uh, in the in the in the uh, in the notes. Yep. And this 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 particular animation sort of shows what it was like when the impactor um, uh, hit, and basically burrowed up to 30 kilometers deep into the uh, the crust of the Earth, which is just stunning when you think about <laughs> it. And in the course of about uh, 10 minutes or so, <laughs> it moved as, as just an astounding amount of Earth. And, and this particular bit of Earth that they were focused on in this in this in this ring, um, basically, is the uh, they, they reckon it moved something like 30 kilometres over the period of about 10 minutes, which is <laughs> which is pretty it's extraordinary. Uh, it's pretty crazy. Uh, and as I say, if you look at this uh, this animation, you can see it all moving around. But what's what's really interesting about this though is is the um, now that they've got these cores and they've got a whole lot of these uh, these drill segments that they've brought up and they're all sort of on ice now and on their way for for uh, extended analysis and then they'll become open to you know the wider scientific community after the the, um, the team are finished with them so they're they're a nice resource for forever for us all to you know not us not you and I obviously we won't <laughs> be there but but uh, us as in you know all of us uh, um, you know, on Earth um, can can benefit humanity yes I still always think about it. A mammal name, Hugh. Anyway, um, so so this uh, these cores that they they brought up, they cover a, a very you know, deep drill that took place, and they they go through a whole lot of different types of materials. And you know, initially it was going through obviously just the sediment and so forth that settled down on top of this impact crater since uh, uh, since you know since the event. And you're looking sort of something about 600 metres down, I believe, if I, if memory serves, as to how far down they had to get before they really started hitting the, the ejector material. And then once they got through that, they started to hit this area in the in this impact ring where, you know, it was a really good uh, sample of, of rock that had moved a very, very long way. And some of this rock would have come down from very, very deep. So they're looking at um, quite uh, deeply formed basalts and so forth that, that are mm -hmm. uh, very telling. Um, they also mentioned that, uh, you know, on the way down, they passed through the the tsunami event you know 
detritus effectively oh. just all the the stuff that would have sloshed around when after this this crater formed and then and then filled itself up because this this process that occurs is once when something hits basically it burrows down and it, it causes you know incredibly dense pressures the, these really high pressures of compression as it, as it as it compresses all the rock and the earth and it all sort of behaves more or less like a fluid mm. and then and then it, it springs back so the the central impact crater basically springs back up and and this is where the um the story title comes from where they, where they was talking about this asteroid strike making instant himalayas because it for a short period of time for a period of minutes it basically built a mountain range that that was more or less the size of Ever, everest uh, from its base which is of course you know starts down in a big hole but uh then you know through this stuff back up and we've we've seen this and we do see this throughout the solar system there are certain impact events that basically build some really cool structures in their middles um you know in the middle of the impact uh, uh, craters um uh, and I, I know i've talked about this with relation to mercury before on the show at some point you know uh, over the yep. years and and in some cases with, with mercury for example there's a there's kind of a, a tower on one side of mercury that that's um that that's aligned with an impact that occurred on that's on its on the opposite side of mercury and it basically it, it was caused by this 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 wave of this compression wave of material going all the way around the planet and then basically meeting on the other side and where it met was directly opposite the impact event so that's that's just awesome so yeah. you know you you, th- you you tend not to think of solids behaving this way but you know when you when you so much energy it, though there's so much energy exactly yeah. so so then you know as you'll see if you look at this animation the uh, uh this mountain range is thrown up and then it all settles back down again and then you know this particular ring that they were looking at is is very uh, indicative because it's all all of that debris and and so forth that was brought up from underneath sort of settled in this ring and and they said that the this this ring that they're looking at is is um is quite a, a good analog to the Schrodinger crater on the moon, mm-hmm. which which looks visually very similar to the Chicxulub crater, and and it would have been made in a very similar way. So again, there's there's some uh, photos of that particular crater, and you can see, you know, it's a very distinct outer rim of the crater, and then a flat area, and then a, like an inner ring, and that would have been caused in much the same way as the as the ring that they were looking at. So in terms of did we learn anything new, I think there'll be a lot of learnings from this over potentially quite a long period of time. It's very early to tell what they'll, you know, what they'll actually take away from the peak ring because they've only really just finished the, um, the dig that they've done. But uh, it, what is really cool is it is already, you know, putting tick boxes against a lot of the theories as to what would have occurred because remembering we're looking at something that happened sort of at the end of the Cretaceous period it's a very long period of time has passed since then Um, the crater itself we didn't even know about until you know I think when when was it found Chicxulub back in the 90s or something or other I think yeah it was fairly recent we knew about the KT boundary the um, levels of I forget what element it is now it's iridium that sort of dictates where it would have been and we sort of knew it was in the yucatan peninsula for a while but i think we only just discovered the actual crater yeah maybe the 90s or so quite recently yeah and so and and then the crater itself which is which is partially off the edge of of the yucatan peninsula is is mostly under un, like probably two-thirds of it or so is 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 under water hmm. but on the, the the part that's still on land on um on the peninsula has has basically got a similar ring of the outside of the crater it's got this similar ring which are made of all of these sinkholes which are called cenotes which are which are really cool if you if you have a look at photos of these things they're just stunningly beautiful um rock formations in the limestone where they've they've basically um you know because of because of the event that's that's thrown all this stuff up they've they've caused uh, enough craters and 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 uh you know channels for water to flow and so forth mm. over you know the 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 many many years since then they've basically washed out and never eroded them so now there's these huge sort of underwater river systems and, and cave systems and so forth and the open sinkholes which are these cenotes that are filled with water which basically just trace the outside of this this crater so you know we've come a long way uh, since it was discovered because there's you know a, a lot of dots have been joined up as to um, you know this event really being implicated in the in the downfall of the dinosaurs or obviously a lot of other species as well um, would have gone at the time 
So yeah, really cool. Um, it's just yeah. one of those, you know, increasing bodies of evidence. But I think for me, one of the the great things of this was just that, in terms of a, a planned um, project, it it looks like it it was it was it went off really really well. You know, yeah, they, they pretty successful. much hit everything they wanted to do. That it in the timeframes that they wanted to do, and I think it's uh, you know real credit to them. Definitely, and just uh, you talked about. Uh, how it's given us a lot of theories about how uh, rocks move and things like that. There's also some more sort of, uh, I guess, out there theories where there was one paragraph uh, in the the Nature article where it talks about, as well as killing the dinosaurs off, the impact could have created uh, an environment where other forms of life could have uh, thrived because it's fracturing these rocks, it's opening up spaces, warm habitats for different kinds of microbes that could move in and yeah. thrive, which is a, a, an interesting uh, way of thinking about it, especially in terms, as you say, of other places in the solar system where we know that these impacts and craters are happening all the time. So Yeah, absolutely, because, you know, the, the energies that are involved as well are, are, are quite interesting because uh, um, there's it's pretty rare to get those sorts of energies involved with something so you know when you think you think back to the whole primal soup you know theories of, of how life sprang forth and so forth uh, it's long been thought that uh, things like lightning would have been involved in that process so um and you know obviously that's a whole nother topic of discussion but uh, but yeah i mean you know the the the, the interweaved web of, of scientific discovery is so cool definitely okay penny let's move on and talk about coconuts now And it seems even the humble coconut could be an endangered species one day. They're under attack from a killer bacteria, aren't they? Yeah, so this is um, a yellowing bacteria, Mm -hmm. which um, can wipe out whole plantations of coconuts. And I guess I've come to grips with this for the banana, that it's such a non-diverse species that it's in danger. But I'd never really thought about coconuts. And in fact, they seem more popular than ever, like coconut yogurt coconut everything is mm, coconut milk coconut in the water, shops at the moment everywhere yeah, yeah 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 like just coconut coconut you'd think they'd be really good so obviously when well not obviously but when something is under threat by a disease often a lack of genetic dis- diversity can make it more difficult to combat and one of the solutions for that is uh, gene banks or seed banks but for coconuts and this is like a thousand things i've just learned about coconuts today <laughs> You can't really – like if you think of a coconut anyway, my my first first thought was that's a pretty big seed to keep in a seed vault. Like think yeah, of how many – Yeah, the coconut itself is, yeah, the, is seed. the seed. So yeah. think of how many poppy seeds you could keep in, you know, a shoebox <laughs> versus how much you need for a coconut. But you can't just keep coconuts because they're so moist and when they dry out, they're no good anymore. So ah. you sort of can't preserve them like other seeds because I'm sure that I've read about – people germinating seeds from Egyptian tombs and stuff, you know, they can last yeah, a really yeah. long time. Grains and things, yeah. Mm. But not coconuts because I guess mm. with all that water they'll go off. Yeah. So to keep a gene bank for coconuts, you need to have a large plantation. And unfortunately the places where it's viable to have large plantations of coconuts are often politically unstable and perhaps unlikely to value you know, a coconut plantation versus more Mm. immediate needs or wants. And the other thing is, here's something else I learned about coconuts, (laughs) is that if you're trying to keep in a gene bank different varieties distinct, they have to be fertilised by hand, which is very dangerous to go and climb it. You have to keep a bag over the female flowers, which the article we read calls a coconut condom. (laughs) Which sounds like a condom made of coconuts, but it isn't. <laughs> it isn't, no. Uh, wow. And these can be like 10 metres tall, these trees. Which is yeah. uh, pretty, as you say, occupational health and safety issues. But the, I guess that the real thing for me is uh, we need to caution everyone. It's not mm. like they're on the brink of being wiped out right now. This no. is mainly uh, affecting sort of two regions, uh, Papua New Guinea and Ivory Coast, but the main coconut-producing countries are Indonesia, the Philippines, Mm. and India. But, you know, what affects these two regions could very easily spread, and it's something that we need to keep in mind. I guess the other option is, can't we just find an antibiotic that will cure this? 
I guess there's the diversity issue is you, you knock down one, Something there's another bacteria that will come. Yeah. yeah. It also makes me wonder, as you say, we know about bananas, which have mm. a low diversity all the time. What else is it that we use all the time? Are there any other things that we need to watch, watch out for? I can't yeah. think of any off the top of my head, but well, we always say the monocultures are what we need to be wary of. So who knows? Let's talk about Mars now. And researchers using NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter have determined that frozen beneath a particular region of Mars's surface lies about as much water as what's in Lake Superior, the largest of the Great Lakes in Northern America. Lucas, we've known that there's water ice on Mars for a long time now. Is it just the scale that makes this interesting? Yeah, I think it is the scale. As you say, we've we've you know we've really dialed in on this now that there is quite a lot of uh, water ice on Mars, uh, and we can even see it to some degree in the in the winter uh, periods of uh, the northern or southern hemisphere on Mars. We do we do tend to see you know the formation of uh, basically ice mm. on its on its poles because there is you know at least some 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 amount of um, moisture. Um, in in those areas, but uh, but yeah, there's uh, there's quite a lot, of, and you know, of course, you can't read this without thinking of um, you know that that iconic movie from the eighties with Schwarzenegger. Uh, the, the, oh, that, Total Recall. Total Recall. Yeah, I was, I was thinking of the that's for making me come to Mars scene that always sticks out of me. But but uh, that whole that whole storyline with the hey, let's make oxygen by melting ice. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> So you're going with possibly that. Happen, but, but in yeah. that movie, there was these great big caves that were full of uh, full of water ice, and hmm. yeah, there's freaking a lot of ice there, basically. <laughs> yeah. I, I think what's uh, what's interesting about this is um, the more interesting about this particular um, uh, hall of ice is its proximity to the surface. Um, this this one's actually quite close to the surface. You know, a lot of the other ice that we know about on on Mars is uh, we know it's there, and we know it's there through a whole you know varying um, uh, array of of, uh, of instruments and so forth that we've we've used to detect it. But in this case, this one's pretty close to the surface, a lot more so than any of the others that we know about, and therefore could potentially be of actual use to you know. Uh, missions to Mars to to uh, use this as a resource, which is mm. which is really cool. And I think the other the other thing that uh, um, you know is important, or, or that you know that, that was interesting about this, is just where it is. Um, there's there's Mars has a particular axial tilt right now, and it's not always the same. Basically, it has quite a a really long period where its its axial tilt does change and therefore its seasons change. So where this ice is right now isn't really aligned to where you would expect to find ice on the planet because it, it right now it, it wouldn't form there mm -hmm. because its tilt is wrong. But it, so that in itself is a bit of a nod to at least you know um, uh, something that we can use as a to dial in the time frame of when of when this might have occurred. In terms of it's this cycle of it uh, of flipping backwards and forward between uh, it's you know it's it's actual tilt that it had and what it has right now, but we do know you know it basically changes. So so this this area it's it's sitting in an area that's sort of you know spanning the latitudes of 39 to 49 degrees, and it's it's basically you know although it's so big, I mean they're talking about over. You know, around they were talking about the Lake Superior as a kind of an analog for this, but, but it's still only about one percent of what we believe is on Mars. What we, you know, what we know is on Mars based on our, uh, you know, other other instruments and so forth right That's now. That's pretty so, impressive, though. I mean, a yeah. huge great lake worth of water, and that's only one percent. That is uh, encouraging, but obviously, this is more much more accessible than all the others. Yeah, uh, in terms of being closer to the surface. So. Yes, that's Still right. Cool. I mean, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think, as I say, the, the, the most interesting thing about this is just the fact that it's uh, really close to the surface and, and accessible to us. And that, that has a lot of implications for um, uh, for exploration and for, you know, colonies on Mars and all those sorts of things that we, we uh, you know, we're talking about doing because, you know, water is important to us. Um, you know, we, we yeah. really, really need it for so many <laughs> things and it's, it can be used for making yeah. fuel, but it, it, more importantly, we need it for life and, and having to take it there, man, that stuff is really, really heavy. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's very good to know that there's quite a lot there and it's, you know, it's, it's quite accessible to us. Excellent. 
Well, that makes our holiday planning a lot easier. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you know, get out your... Um, it wouldn't be... What, what's the uh, the well-known travel guide that people uh, used Lonely to get? Lonely Planet? Lonely Planet, yeah. I suppose it still could be Lonely <laughs> Somewhat Planet. Somewhat ironic, and it, really. And is, yeah. And Mars, it's very Lonely Planet. <laughs> but uh, at least now you can you can find an area with water. You so can get a nice. drink, yep. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's finish on a happy note, shall we? <laughs> Penny, do you want to tell us the tale of Jeremy, the left-coiled snail? <laughs> I, th- I thought this was a nice little story. I love story. this story. Um, yeah. So, Jeremy is a very special snail because, well, his or her, his and her, because snails are hermaphroditic. Oh. Jeremy's, I'll use the, <laughs> try and not use pronouns, Jeremy's <laughs> uh, shell coils to the left. Which is a really um, outward sign of a kind of left-handedness all over. And we have this asymmetry too. So if you think about, even though our bodies are generally quite symmetrical, for example, our hearts are usually to the left, but people Mm -hmm. can have a condition where this all gets reversed. Yep. And this is one of those really interesting things I think about in biology. I won't go into the details of it, but this starts out from when you're an embryo of only a couple of cells and those first divisions already have this idea of sort of handedness and reversibility. So Mm -hmm. a gene has been identified that might be involved in this left hand, in this sort of reverse or this coiling, this asymmetry. And if it does, then Jeremy the snail probably has it. So what do you want to do when you want to find out a bit more about how a gene works is it's really good to mate and see what the offspring are like. However, because um, Jeremy is a hermaphrodite and so on, but he could mate with any other snail, but it can't mate with a normal or a right-turning snail because the genitalia is on the wrong side of the body. So, Don't you hate it when that happens? Oh, so <laughs> awkward. Like, you meet a guy. <laughs> uh, let's not finish that thought. No. <laughs> You meet a snail. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the... So the, um, the, sna- the shell gets in the way then. Uh, yeah. It's coiled. So unless you find another one in a hundred thousand snail with a left coiled shell, there is no mating for Jeremy. He's on his own. Well, luckily the lab that got a hold of Jeremy went onto snail Tinder. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. On Jeremy's behalf. And (laughs) a a snail um, collector, snail farmer, snail snail enthusiast responded. She had a left lefty, (laughs) a left coiling snail. And so let's hope that uh, lefty and Jeremy hit it off. Okay. So we we haven't heard yet whether or not they've started mating or. If anything's happened. No, no. Okay. But and that's, that's the plan. Just one final thing that I learned about snails as well as coconuts today is, <laughs> do you know how snails make love? I confess I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just learned this. They stab each other with calcium oh. crystals known as love darts. Oh. Isn't that that's, nice? That, that's a really lovely way of describing a stabbing. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently these crystals contain a hormone because when you have two hermaphrodites mating, mm. at some point one has to act as the male and give the sperm and one has to act as the female and receive them. So right. this stabbing process, I guess, kind of determines that. Wow. That yeah. is interesting. I did not know that. Me neither. You learn something new every day, right? And I'll also have to say, I've never even noticed that snails mostly call to the right direct one direction. I never even picked up on that. I was, I guess I thought it was a random thing and that they coil both ways, so to speak. I had but, some vague memory of it from, you know, a first year or a second year biology lecture, but I have to confess it hasn't really crossed my mind since. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I'll always be on the lookout. Every time I see a snail, I'll go, Oh, is that one in 100,000? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, all right. Well, I think that's our show. Of course, you can get more information at scienceontop.com slash 249. And there you can find all the ways to get in touch with us, as well as spread the word on social media. And you can always leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks for joining us today, Penny and Lucas. No worries. Thank you. 
This episode was edited with intense concentration by Marcos Benamou. And thank you everyone for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Bye.